What is up, you savages? This is the Protect Your Neck Podcast, and I'm your host, Dan Tom. Analyst is work you could find over at MMAJunkie.com. But on this year's program, the Protect Your Neck Podcast, we break down high-level MMA and in a slightly different way. That's right. It's a week off in the UFC schedule, not to timestamp it, although there are you know very few of those per year, so you could probably narrow it down to when we're doing this. But yes, it is a top-five show, something I like to do here on this channel. Thank you for liking, subscribing, Daniel Tom MMA. Or if you're listening to the audio version, that'll be on the Protect Your Neck Podcast at the PYN Podcast on all social platforms. I appreciate you guys as you are all familiar with these top five shows where I bring in a co-host, uh, one who uh, obviously I, I've been trying to, you know, I, I've known for, for a minute. I, I'm overdue. I, I'm going to apologize it, uh, to him here in a second. Of course, that is my man, Sean Humes, who is going to help me with this topic as we're going to set up for you. You can follow him or you might be familiar with him already on Twitter as at Black, B-L-A-K, Jordan Breen. Hey, shouts to Jordan Breen as well. Uh, on Twitter, of course, Sean is an analyst. He does a lot of scouting work uh, for a lot of the fighters you're familiar with, and I'm not going to step on those. We're going to get through that uh, in a second. Uh, you also may know him from CombatPress.com, MMA Ratings, uh, and other things that I'm going to throw to him because he also does uh, some extracurricular stuff that uh, I find particularly awesome, and you may see him share uh, that uh, is a bit topical to the entertainment uh, uh, if you enjoy uh, certain types of movies. So, Sean, the elongated intro, the prolonged, uh, you know, have, finally having you on. What's up, dude? Thanks for coming on. Uh, not too much, man. Thank you very much for having me on the show. I'm a big fan. I've I've listened to your show, listened to what breakdowns or articles you've done. I've always been very impressed with your attention and detail and uh, your commitment to the sport. There's there's actual people who get paid to train people who aren't as committed in a, in in detail as you are and what you're doing, which is very scary when you think about they're sending fighters to the cage. But uh, I'm, I've been very impressed by your work ethic and uh, your attention detail and, and your passion for the sport. I appreciate that, man. And um, you mentioned detail, and that's obviously something that you have to focus on yourself. I mentioned, obviously, in that intro, the, the many things that you do and, and contribute to. Um, scouting and analysts, that's how I personally known you and your reputation for Schwan. So, um, that's what we're going to kind of talk about here. It will come up naturally, of course, if you're reading the, the, the show topic, of course. This is, uh, you know, I'm, I don't know exactly how I'm going to have a title, but lo- but loosely it's going to be essentially top five tools or things. Uh, that's the word I'm kind of trying to decide on that essentially you would want to prep your fighter for, whether you're a head coach, manager, analyst, scout, and we're going to kind of go over these roles. And I've actually... Um, cited some of these people, both coaches and managers, and we'll get to their lists as we will get to your list as we typically do on these shows at the end. I know this isn't a normal one to contribute to. Uh, Perhaps many of you feel like, what the heck, I'm just a hardcore fan. What what do I know about prepping fighters? I'm just going to sit and watch and listen, and we appreciate you, but also I want to just, as we set it up, and Shawan, you can weigh in here, um, that although... We're gonna get into, uh, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna specifically you, Schwan, get into your background here in a second, just so you guys know that we're not completely out of our depths talking about this. But yes, um, we are, we are not, uh, you know, uh, MMA coaches or in the corners that you would see in UFC shows. Uh, someone asked, you know, did the typical coming at me on Twitter like, have you ever fought a corner before? And I'm like, yes, I've done both. That being said, um, those were both on really crappy amateur shows. I'm definitely not going to. Uh, overinflate my very limited experience, but um, I will be drawing on some of that, uh, which is what got me into this field in the first place. Um, you know, as far as this side of things, outside of the cage, looking in, Schwan. As far as from broad topic here, from martial arts, obviously this is what we love and talk about. To how you got to like scouting and looking at it from more analytical eye and getting into doing what you do for. Some real high-level pros. Um, I've dabbled a bit in the scouting, but not nearly as much as you or for nearly as many names. So broad answer, big question. What's your background, man? Uh, I started doing martial arts years ago. I used to go to the University of Houston. They had a grappling club, and I just I didn't know anything at all. And I just basically showed up and got my ass kicked for like six months straight before I even learned how to defend a submission and do any, any competent manner. Because a lot of people, they learn by... Um, like kind of learned they they got taught some, they got taught something they adjusted they learned I kind of just went in there and just le- learned through firsthand experience by just getting out wrestled by JUCO wrestlers former college wrestlers Brazilian Jiu Jitsu black belts judo I mean like thrown slam choke every possible thing and University of Houston is like a 
is a school with a, gro- with a bit in a cross section of students from other countries, other areas. So you got to, you know, I met people who are legitimate submission wrestlers, le- legitimate catch wrestlers. You know, some guys used to fight over in other countries. So you got a lot of experience in that. And then occasionally they would let us do where we could do sessions where we just spar, like, you know, everything, MMA type sparring. So that's where I got my start. And then from then, I just started, when I moved back home, I just started finding people online and I find clubs where they train at. I show up on sparring nights and I would just learn through doing it. And then you get people see you enough times in different, enough different places. You start meeting amateur fighters, pro fighters, and they start uh, kind of like letting, letting you get in on some of the training sessions for the uh, camps. Like you might, they're doing a round robin, they just spar with 10 people. Obviously, I'm not one of the better people. So I'm towards the end of that 10. But I still got to go in there. So I got to spar with some Invicta people, some UFC people, some Bellator type people. And I just spent a lot of time in gyms, whether it's boxing, kickboxing, MMA, grappling. I spent a lot of time in gym. I pick up a lot of stuff. I'd ask a lot of questions. And uh, coaches would start asking me. They're like, well, what do you think about this? You've been around here. You think he, you've think you seen him enough times. Is he on today or is he not? Oh, he's not? Take him out. Take him out. You say he's not on. You see him all the time. And uh, people would just start picking up stuff with me. And I translated it to analysts and kind of a journalistic point of view when i got on the twitter i started calling into the shirt the shirt out network back when it was the radio show was going i called jordan breen and uh <laughs> he would just like you know he's like you're a real smart guy you really got a good eye for this and that's why i came up with the black jordan breen because i was a black guy obviously he's not and it was kind of like a homage to him because i respected his take on things and his overall ability to comprehend and break down technique and strategy and he respected mine and kind of gave me some encouragement so then i made myself the black jordan breen and i started writing for MMA ratings. They offered me a chance to be on their podcast and write for them, so I started writing for them. And then a Combat Press came, and then Severe MMA liked my stuff, so they started um, wanting me to do breakdowns and assessments for them. And I just started doing it on my own, and then I started having people on Twitter who had friends who kickbox or who boxed or did MMA, and they'd come to me like, look at this film. Tell me what you see, tell me what you see about their opponent. And I got my big start when King Mo actually contacted me. We used to talk online and talk trash about fights, and when he went over to the Risen tournament, he was like, in a big camp, they don't have enough time to cover all these people, especially when there's changes. So some of these guys I don't know anything about. I need you to break them down for me, do an, it, as detailed as possible an assessment, give me what your idea of a game plan is, and we're going to we're gonna work that out to uh, pull that off. And then he won the Risen tournament, which was the biggest thing. And then he went on YouTube and thanked me. What, I was one of the people he thanked for coming up with a game plan for it, which is where it kind of set off for me. And then from there, it just... People just started coming to me, and Stephen Wright offered to have mentor me. Uh, J- Johnny Hendricks, ex-coach, he wanted me to move to Dallas so he could mentor me because he's like, you have a talent for this. And he would hit me up about fights. Uh, the Pitbull brothers, back when Claudia Gadelia was working in New Mexico for the Carolina Kovacavich fight and uh, the uh, Andrade fight, they contacted me, wanted my take on it. You know, I, I just get a lot of like, contact from people. Um, I forgot her name. She, her, it's like Amanda Bobby Cooper. I know her camp. I talked to them a couple times, gave them some stuff. They didn't listen, but I still told them. <laughs> but uh, that's that's essentially how I got into it. And um, like you said, I've never fought. I've worked corners. Um, I've actually broken down film. I've come up with game plans. And a lot of guys try to push back. They're like, you didn't fight. And I'm like, well, first of all, Greg Jackson never fought. And y'all pay him millions to coach you. And he's never been, he's never been in, a, in an organized fight by his own words. John Jones listened to him. Rashad Evans listened to him. GSP listened to him. I'm not saying I'm on that level, but that defeats your argument altogether. And secondly, when I used to talk to King Mo, King Mo was telling me, he's like, you don't have to fight. You just have to have a, a legitimate point of reference. If you spar good amateurs, if you spar pros, whether they went all out on you or not, you have a point of reference of the reactions and the things it takes and the pressure you're going to be under. Now, you don't have it under the big lights, but getting grounded and pounded is still getting grounded and pounded. Getting leg kick is leg kick. Getting submitted is submitted. You have a point of reference that we can work from. And the fact of the matter is most fighters aren't students of the game and most coaches aren't students of the game. You're a student of the game. So while you don't have that real life experience, you have so much more in watching film and understanding what you're seeing, which closes the gap. Because they have life experience over you, but they don't know how to watch film. They don't know how to process fighters. They don't know how to prepare anybody. And you do. So they might have a huge advantage here. You have an equally huge advantage on this other side. So don't let people talk to you like you don't know what you're doing. And um, I've had a couple of fighters. Usually, most famously, Team Alpha Male came after me on uh on twitter um danny castillo did he was pretty mad at me because i was breaking out fights and he was like he and I'll, I'll wrap this up he was like he started going through the list trying to discredit me he's like we've well, recorded a guy yeah 
you train martial arts? I'm like, yeah. Have you ever got a guy to a, a world title or a big title? I was like, yeah. You worked with a big name? I'm like, yeah. And you could just see, I could just sense the frustration. And then he hits it. Have you ever fought before? No. Him and Team Alpha Male stands piled on me. You don't know. You never fought. <laughs> but wow, he was man. so frustrated because he didn't have me on anything until he asked that question. So um, I, I'm like you. I, I've had people push back against it. And I tell people, you don't have to listen to me. But more times than not, when I give somebody advice or I give them direction and they don't listen, the next morning is 15 texts. Oh, how'd you know? How'd you know he's going to do that? Oh, I should have listened to you. You know, I, I don't know what to tell you after that point, you know. Man, so many similar, so many similarities here, man. Of uh, you know, uh, as far as that background goes, and I especially love, you know, uh, the, the Sure Dog Radio and the, all the iterations of it, right? Over the uh, over the years, definitely not going to go in all the different titles, but man, yeah. and shouts to Jordan Breed, another guy who overdue, uh, you know, um, to reach out to. Obviously, a guy I highly respect. Anybody should who's been around in this space, but very similar because I was on the opposite end where I was, you know going on my things where when I was competing, I was trying to tell people, I'm like, I, I was a terrible fan. Like when I wasn't calling into, I was on MMA junkie radio. So on the other side, tag radio, when they were tag and I followed them over when they were MMA junkie radio. And I got my start from calling in and I essentially called in and broke down like Charles Oliveira, Jim Miller and all these fights. And like, I even called, um, like, and my, I did my first predictions, which was kind of ironic because later, you know, I would go on the show as, an analyst, but I remember calling, I think, UFC 118, my first predictions, and I even called, um, I think it was Nate Diaz to beat Marcus Davis by third round, but specifically, and I never, before or since, I rarely will ever predict something to be doctor stoppage by cuts, but Davis cuts a lot, and I predicted that that was going to be it, and if it was anywhere but Boston, that fight was going to get stopped by cuts. Um, of course, they let Davis fight on despite two doctor's interventions, and it, it, it goes down as a guillotine win. But I remember like that fight and stuff, and that kind of call got me a lot of like respect and clout from the callers because you know I'm, I'm a new guy. I wasn't around in the chat. I wasn't in the combat chats or anything like that. Um, and uh, so, kind of similar to you, uh, you know, it kind of came oh, up Dan, through. Dan, Dan, real quick, yep, real quick, Dan, Dan. I forgot to mention this is the one that actually made me uh, former analyst Pat Whiteman in a Connor Rebush of heavy hands actually made my whole career because for years I told, I told Pat Wyman how, how to beat Ronda Rousey and nobody ever believed me. So that I called him that Holly Holm was going to stop her. Once I did that, that's when everybody really started paying attention. They're like, you didn't call it. And then people started pulling up. They're like, he called this shit like a year ago. That's when, that's, that's when I really broke through when people were like, Oh shit, he knows what he talks about. He called like as big as the set. He didn't call the night before he called it like three. That's my thing. Picking up sets. Rose over Joanna, Cruz over D Dillashaw. That's been the thing that's made me the biggest. Picking these huge upsets, fights that shouldn't happen that way is the ones I always pick. Sorry to interrupt. That's nice. That's no, that's a good one. That's a good shout. And good shout to Pat, man. I miss that guy. Connor, obviously. Love Connor. He's on this show. Uh, he's been on here a couple times. But, um, but yeah, man. Uh, basically, yeah, it came up very similar as far as that would go. And in the gym... When I would stop calling, it was because I was focusing, you know, on competing and stuff and being in the gym, even though I was doing it at a super low level. Um, or, uh, you still pick up a lot of things, you know, through osmosis, whether you're in the back or you're in the back and, you know, going out to corner or, you know, I'm going out to get, you know, my butt kicked for three rounds by Marvin Eastman's son. There's there's experience there, right? And even though, you know, I, I fought, it's like, well, just because I fought, you know, according to the Danny Castillo thing, does that make me more... Any more experience than than, than than Sean just because I had three rounds of head trauma and Sean didn't? Like, this, so that makes me better now? Like, I don't, you know, so I always laugh at that. Like, I'm proud of my experiences, but I always temper people. Like, you don't have to have experience. And I'll use the similar things to you, like the Greg Jacksons of the world or, one. you know, one of my coaches, Neil Melanson, who uh, I just saw, like, some, some you know, some random comment on Twitter, like, oh, man, this guy is, like, a really, uh, really good at teaching. And that's what kind of drew me to him because he didn't have – the accolades back like 10 years ago when I was learning on under him, he was kind of just a guy that came from highest and was Caro's guy. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, and, and just, but that, that, that is the thing. Whereas I've went to some, you know, whether they're former fighters or like really big popular jujitsu guys, I've went to those schools too. And I still love them as fighters or grapplers or people or whatever, I'm not saying anything bad, but I got, can easily 12% out of what I would get out of uh, a Robert Fallis rest in peace class or a Neil Melanson class. And 
a lot of these guys were either they never fought or they did and they, they, they got their asses kicked, you know, uh, when they did do it, <laughs> you know. Um, I think Follis had some of those for sure, right? And again, I just made fun of my own story like that. So again, it's really, you gotta really be careful by just because you fought to, to strengthen your previous point, Sean. Just because you fought doesn't, it's not some end all be all, folks. Um, it's how you process the information. Uh, I think you got to be of a certain personality to even do that, right? Just like you have to be of a certain personality, for better or worse, to fight and get in a cage. You have to have a kind of blind confidence. Yes. You know? Um, so we'll talk about that uh, and incorporate definitely that as far as. Yeah, let me let me give a quick shout out to a Randy Couture. I I totally forgot this, and you, and you, you sharing your story. There used to be a. A show, a guy named Goldman, he used to cover MMA years ago, like long, long time ago. Eddie Goldman, I think. And uh, I sent in a breakdown of a of a, how I thought Chuck Liddell, and uh, this was years ago when he fought um, Randy Couture and he lost. And the guy, would, he he showed it to Randy Couture, and I wish I saved the email. I had it for years, but I lost it. It was years and years and years ago. But Randy Couture was like, whoever this guy is understands what he's doing. He understands like, the context of fighting and that was like one of the things him saying that and then later on king mo actually coming to me directly is what actually gives me the biggest point of confidence at any given point when people started like you don't know what you're talking about i'm like okay one of the greatest ufc heavyweights of all time thought i know and king mo is like a student in the game like everybody goes to him for information so i don't really care what y'all think but yeah, yeah I'm sorry. That's just Mo, Mo, Mo's weird huge, story. man. Weird story popped out. Hey, Mo, Mo's that's crossover with MMA Junkie. MMA Junkie's been big, big Mo supporters for a while, giving him a platform, um, so that people knew that Mo was more than just a fighter. Uh, that great I would, dude, all, I would, all, yeah, a great guy and really smart guy. Funny, smart, um, all these things that you know perhaps fighters don't necessarily get credit for or enough for. And Mo has the, those things in spades. And I would always say that. And it's because, you know, uh, coming from the MMA Junkie Radio days, he would uh, he would have him, he would say, hey, let me pop you on my, this guy uh, here. I'm getting ready. Help him get ready for his first MMA fight. His name's DC. You guys are going to hear from him. King Mo was the one saying da- uh, Dagestan first. And, you know, we were giving him crap going, oh, what? Like, because like, we would always like, mess with, because Mo would always be like, hey, yo, dog. Listen, dog. Listen, dog. We're like, oh, Dagestan? You trying, to, trying to get one out over on his Mo? And he was like... It was like the one time he was trying to be serious. He's like, no, you guys aren't understanding. Dagestan is the next thing. And he was saying this years before Khabib uh, even got to the UFC, right? Like, he was on that, to your point. Um, and so that's a huge credit right there, having a guy like Mo uh, or Randy and whatnot. And maybe that's why, you know, people entrusted, you know, um, which is just to kind of bring it full circle here on why we're weighing in on on, on the context of preparing a fighter, martial artists, um, you know, martial arts fights, analyzing them and coming at it from this perspective. Um, you had your own experiences with Texas, which is another great underrated scene, man. Even you go back in the days of like the 1960s, like sport karate days, like half of those dudes were from Texas, like as far as like yeah. the American uh, point fighting karate guys. Anyways, neither here nor there. Uh, and then me, my, my own through extreme couture, whether it was having guys like, you know, Neil Melanson take over his classes, even though I was only like, what, a blue or purple belt at the time, uh, or Robert Fallis pushing me to do this and break fights down when I was injured and, and couldn't be on the mats. Um, because perhaps kind of like people saw in you, you Schwan, that they're like, hey, you know, yeah, you might not, you know, be the best at doing these things or have that in life experience, but you have all these other things that can be very helpful that what pe- and not again, discrediting fighters or these jujitsu uh, talents or grappling talents, these combat sports people, if you will. But let's just be honest, there are things that they lack and arguably perhaps need to lack to kind of do these things. And that yes. is where coming to this topic to set it up, Schwan, that is where it's important for whether you're calling it the manager, the coach, whatever the operating body is, we're going to operate from an all-encompassing neutral here. It is important to structure the fighter to set them up for success because these guys are energizer bunnies for the most part. They're, they're going to go forward. You can attach stuff onto them. Yes, you can adjust the tracks in front of them and kind of curry the tracks a little bit. Sure. Um, but, you know, these fighters, and they're not beyond criticism, uh, we're not giving them a pass here, but we're just going to more focus on the stuff that needs to be done outside of them. Is that is that fair characterization? Yeah, that makes sense. That makes perfect sense. Yeah, I, I think that the, the key point you made is there's a difference between coaching and fighting. Like That's why fighters get into coaching after they're in the tail end of their career or after their career is done because it takes a complete different mentality. As you as a coach, when you're watching somebody, when you're a fighter, you're going until you get stopped. As a coach... It's my job to not let you go until you get stopped. 
You know, it's like I'm supposed to be looking out for signs that you can't continue or that you're losing control of the fight or you're taking too much reviews. As a fighter, it's your job to fight. If you have the same fighter mentality as a coach, you're going to get somebody hurt. You're going to ruin their career. You can't have that same mentality. You well, have to have a different. You can share right. it slightly, but you have to be at a different point. Like as a fighter, you got to be right here. As a coach, you can still share that mentality, but you got to be on the higher thought process. How's this going to affect us two, three years down the line? You can't just be like, I got to win. I got to win at all costs. Yeah, that doesn't matter if two, three, two fights from that now, you totally fall off a cliff because of this one fight. That's not worth it. Absolutely, and to to that point, it's, you know, to the, the to the Danny Castillo point, I guess I should say, to bring that up about fighting is that again, just because you fought in a cage, it doesn't mean all of a sudden you're one size fits all for every role in the sport. This is why I, qu I quickly shut down people who are like when they're complaining about judges, we need more fighters as judges. I'm like, no, because and shout out to the fight site, something I always uh, always talk about uh, when it comes to whether it's betting bias or bet betting or fight analysis or any of the iterations is that you have to know your own biases, and I think that also applies for a fighter slash the person preparing the fighter, which is why. To our point here, you you have to take certain responsibilities off their plate, um, and also why not and not that you're saying or I'm saying that you can't be a good coach and a good a good fighter and a good coach. Um, you know, I know James Krause has been doing some great things and whatnot. Perhaps we will mention his camp or those styles here, but like uh, I'm not saying you can't. I'm just saying that just because you fought doesn't mean you're going to be one size fits all and largely i will say it's because of the strong biases and wiring needed to be a fighter whereas all these other roles we have to separate our biases which is impossible because you're always going to have them but you have to know them as an analyst as a better as a coach um as a judge right uh you, you bias i think is a real key word here yes everybody has them in inherently absolutely so we're going to go through our top five tools uh that we would you know lay out to to, to to prep uh to prep a fighter in camp okay so everything from you know a to z physical mental health specializations without you know stepping on too many things here all these kind of generals i'm sure sean's going to have them worded slightly different and in that sense there are going to be crossover we are going to keep our same top five format going from five to one like a tennis game back and forth here um there there probably will be crossover in this uh even though it will be slightly different worded but we will explain um our steps and our prioritizations there's no right or wrong answers but i feel like uh i feel pretty confident in in um in my list and the way i have it numbered how about how about you sean any 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 challenges or any things uh that came up to you in preparing this list want to tackle this topic my, my the only challenge i have is because um it's the same challenge i have when i develop kids in basketball because i know what i'm doing and I've and I've been the I've, I've been my only resource, and people have always pushed uh, pushed back against me. I'm kind of very direct and to the point. I'm not confrontational, but I don't kind of like if I have an issue with a fighter, I'll use a certain fighter as an example. And some people are like, "Well, I don't want to be offensive." And I'm not trying to be offensive either. To me, it's stating facts. It's the same thing a, a fighter actually told me, a boxer, when I was watching a boxing match, and people, were, other boxers, were like, "You never fought, you don't know." And the boxer told me, he goes, "Now you might know, not know what to do." You might not be able to do this under pressure, but a fact is a fact. If he needs to use his jab more, it doesn't matter if you've been there or not. The fact is his jab was not good enough. That's just a fact. So to me, when I'm pointing out a fighter, using him as an example, I'm not attacking them. I'm not saying I can do what they can do. I'm just saying it's a fact. Look at look at their history. Look, look at the context I'm speaking of. And then if you can attack me on that fact, then that's fine. But don't get into the, uh, well, I like this fighter. They're so brave. That, that's all well and good. It doesn't mean they were developed properly. Just because you like that coach doesn't mean that coach didn't make a mistake. Everybody makes a mistake. Sure. And if you find a coach who says they don't make mistakes, get the hell out of that camp because yeah. that's going to be a bad, bad matchup. Yeah, absolutely. And we'll, we'll definitely uh, get to those things because there's so many facets to attack this list. You know, uh, just from the coaches that you mentioned, uh, uh, coaching, uh, you know, perspective. And I'm, we'll get to that at the end with with coaches I'll, I'll be able to cite here. Um, but basically, uh, yeah, well, let's get this started. Um, I feel like uh, even though I usually lead the dance for someone on the first time of the show, I feel like you should lead the dance on this one with uh, your number five. Uh, not necessarily that um, it's not as important as a number one or a number three on your list, uh, but it does make, I'm, sh I'm assuming it makes your top five for good reason. What is the number five thing in your top five things that a, a fighter uh, should have done for them as far as camp preparations? Um, I really think this is more intangible, but I think 
when a when a camp gets a fighter or they have a fighter, they have to understand who and what that fighter is. A lot of fighters lose because their camps can't correctly assess athletic talent. They have a slightly above average athlete, but they think because they're not used to watching other sports, they, they don't know what elite athleticism is. So their whole base, their whole style is based off of um, their explosiveness, their dynamic strength, their agility, their quickness. And on a regional level, you'll blow through a lot of guys because you're fighting guys like me. You're fighting regular guys. Okay, athletes, fairly decent. So if you're above average, you probably look like a Roy Jones to him. You look like a Francis Ngannou athletically. But then you go to the UFC where it's national people, people from all over the world, and you find out that your athleticism doesn't transfer. And all of a sudden now, you can't get to the spot you used to. You can't get out of the spot you used to. And since they taught you based off your athleticism, they didn't teach you how to jab your way in because your power has always been good enough. They didn't teach you correct footwork because your foot speed has always been good enough. So now when that's not good enough and there's pushback, you have no idea how to respond because you haven't developed counters that bring you back to your plan A or plan B and a plan C that will take you back to your plan A, which is what you want. Plan A is your strength. That's why it's your plan A. But when it's all based off attributes, when that gets neutralized, you don't have a plan B and plan C to fall back on. And all plan B and plan C do is set you back, find a creative way to get you back to plan A where that works. But if you've been the best athlete, like you see an OSP, he's an exceptional athlete, but when you're the best athlete and they don't have people to match you, you get you coast on that. And then when you get that pushback, you don't have answers. You, you, you don't know do anything except athlete in, athlete out. Athlete in, athlete out. And I can say faint. You don't know how about faint. Why have you? Why would you ever faint? You're super fast. You don't need it. Throwing combination. You've only had knockout power. Why do you need combinations? So it, it's knowing who your fighters being able to being able to acknowledge who they are right away and build a style that's going to help them at their max peak potential and help them when they lose a step. The best example: Carolina Kovačević. Her team trained her like she was Jessica Andrade, like some unstoppable tank. She's never been that person. As a result, she's had all the world class beaten out of her, and now that she's lost a step, she doesn't have any tools to maintain distance, to 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 close distance, to cut people off. It's all been conditioning, physicality, and durability. Well, now that's not enough, and she has she hasn't gotten any better than she has the first year the first year she stepped in the UFC, except for experience and comfort. Technically, she's the same fighter, all because they misjudged who she is as an athlete. I I I, I like that point too. I remember getting a. Uh kind of an inside word from Kovalkiewicz's camp. I want to say this is UFC 223. I think she's fighting Felice Herrig. And I think she actually won that fight, okay? But I remember picking against her pretty confidently just for the single fact that I was aware that someone in her camp instilled it in her that one of their main game plans was to Imanari roll for a leg lock. And I'm not I'm, I'm your least leg lock hater you're going to find out there, by the way, Schwan. But you better be damn good, and it better be in a matchup that calls for it. And... She had no semblance that she was damn good at that or any of the connecting pieces to that. Um, and against who she was going against, uh, say what you will about Felice Herrig. I know she also has her, her on-paper creds is in kickboxing, but she really is, uh, you know, especially more relevant at that time and more relevant in her MMA career, was a strong clincher who could really work from top, top half. Those were her best positions. Yeah. And you're going to pretty much give her, you're going to, if you fail in your leg lock, a 50-50 entanglement, you're probably going to fall on bottom and in a half guard. So just off those facts alone, I ended up picking against her. Now, she ends up winning, and thankfully for her, she didn't end up doing that move that I just said. She actually did show it in that fight later on in the third round, which is silly, and she got away without you know paying for it. And I, I remember I was just like, that was probably bad, really bad that, you know, you never want to say that it's bad that a fighter got a win, but when they have a, a bad mentality and a bad practice and they get rewarded from it, it almost kind of puts another nail in the coffin, right? It's 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 the same thing. If you watch basketball, you see kids take bad shots and they hit them. Now they think they can hit that shot all the time. No, you just lucked out. Well, I lucked out 10 times. It's not going to be, you can't maintain that. And I have, it's like something my dad taught me. Don't do things that you can't maintain going forward. Kovacavich doesn't have that. Now, Kovacavich was like an Jessica Andrade. A lot of the mistakes she makes could be navigated through because she'd have such great athleticism and power to make up for. She doesn't have it. They're, they're asking her to do things that are going to put her in a position that she, she can't survive and she can't get out of. And against the better athletes, Claudia Gedalia couldn't survive, couldn't get out of. Against Joanna Jadrick, can't say her name correct, she could never get into the position she needed to work. Even against Rose Namajunas when she fought her, if Rose, instead of would have constantly backed, because Rose was hitting her hard, but Rose was trying to get away from her pressure. 
If Rose would have sat down early and put some heat on her shots and volume to break the pressure through meeting her at the point of contact, she would have knocked her out. The only reason she kept building momentum is because Rose kept giving her the space to recover because she didn't want to get grabbed or held on. And it, and avoiding that, she let her build momentum. But if you don't let her build momentum, she has nothing. She's a slightly above average athlete with a, with a very good chin. That's it. With a low skill a low skill set. The only reason she got by is because people get scared when you, they can't scare you off and she doesn't get tired. But when she started facing people who can make her pay for it, she looked beat. She looked terrible. She looked terrible against Grasso. She looked terrible against Joanna. She looked awful against Claudia. She looked bad against Michelle Watterson. Because though that whole strategy they built off those tools that don't exist got her exposed. Totally. And so that goes back to your number five, which is basically know your fight knowing your fighter. That's a great one and a great one to start off uh in. And even though I thought I was being kind of hipster, uh, because I always like to start off my number fives as kind of a the hipster pick. And even though this is a more serious topic we're tackling, right, uh, I still kind of kept in that seam. So I went a bit hipster here, but I do think it applies to Know Your Fighter because I, I wrote um, Psyche uh, for my number five. And it's a very Excellent. general, it's Excellent. general, but but it, I, I believe it pairs with what yours is. And Psyche, I always tell people, my fighters are, I just said this recently um, when I was talking about what, why my theory as far as, you know, um, Stipe's vision or you could talk about a fighter's confidence another it's hard to get it from the fighters or their interviews because whether the fighters in the cage or their interview again they're the energizer bunny back to that thing they're going to push forward yes some have better po poker faces and durability to hide it than others obviously right some are easier to decode in their interviews they're not as clever speakers obviously however it doesn't matter they're going to put on their best version whatever it is of the poker face and go forward it, it's an unreliable a fighter is an unreliable narrator in a lot of senses um, whereas if you really want to know a lot of these things from their confidence level to potential injuries or certain things like that, listen to their corner, listen to how their corner speaks to them in the rounds, in the corner, the corner will, will give away all the cards. If you know what you're looking for folks. Now, this is again, speculative theory, speculative mechanics, speculation. I'm not trying to sit here and say, this is the Bible. This is the one way, or, you know, this is, this is the key. But there is a lot that can be parsed out there. Um, I, I think a lot of us waste our time going, well, but he, the fighter said he's working on his wrestling or the fighter said he's fine. Like, fighters are always going to say that. Um, you have to look at what the fighters are, are, are kind of speaking to them, you know. And a lot of the times I can tell if a fighter, especially if you've got that fighter who's, you know, they're, they got a lot of first round finishes. They don't do as well when it goes to the decision. And you hear the corner just pleading with them to, to breathe and calm down or they're bolstering their confidence or talking to them like they're a child. It's not to say that that fighter is weak or this or that, but again, if we're speaking from kind of facts here, like you know, um, it, it, it probably does say a lot about their psyche. They need to be they need to be nursed. You know, uh, I remember Neil talking the difference between coaching Vitor Belfort and Randy. And Neil <laughs> Neil used to train dogs in the military uh, for dr drug enforcement, uh, terrorist squads, counter terrorist squads, and he trained a lot of his from his grapplers to his fighters. He trained them a lot like dogs. He would do kind of hard sparring, like you would hear about, like as far as like the kickboxing versions, the AKA, the shoot boxes. But he did the more grappling version of that, which some fighters liked and some fighters didn't. Um, Randy Couture, the, the the complete savages of the world, those guys that came from the more wrestling, they they loved this style because this was very similar to their style. And whereas Neil would, he wouldn't just be babying and yes manning because you can pamper a fighter's ego too much and you're not helping them, right? So yes. he would he would he would give the proper play and let them win in the positions they needed to win if they were if they were following the game plan if they were attacking correctly according to the opponent but when the fighter got off variation he would let them know he would correct them very hard yeah. strike submission and Neil was a big guy obviously he's 6'5 275 he can enforce these things even on heavyweights right um and and so that was just kind of one one style of coaching and even though I like that, and I, I liked it because I felt like it was a good balance of where you could nurture, but then you also make the corrections where it, uh, it, it needs to be done. And you want to find those corrections in camp, not like you said, where, you know, the coaches allow them to, 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 to you know, get away with their, their foot speed. But when they have a fighter, they can cut the cage, uh, and now you're in the small cage, and you're fighting on a higher level. Now those answers, your athleticism isn't bailing you out, kind of to your previous point. So uh, I know I know we're getting down more tactical, but but rounding back to psyche, I think psyche is important. Sean, what about you? I I um there's one there's two reasons two things I'll probably bring this up later, but 
briefly, I'll touch on one thing. A lot of camps, a lot of camps, I know this for a fact, they lie to their fighters. They only coach from a position of strength, and that's why they're, they have to beg and plead because they didn't push them past a certain point in camp. So the minute it goes off script, that fighter, they're like, please, just hang on two, 20 seconds. All you got to do is hang on. Please hang on because all you've done is play to their – oh, he can't stop this. You can get out of that. I understand building confidence, but you don't build confidence through lying. I don't. I have four kids. I don't lie to them to build confidence. I build com- confidence in actual facts. When I develop basketball players, confidence in actual facts because you can rest on that confidence because it actually exists. They lie to them, and that confidence is always going to get exposed in something as one-on-one as fighting. Second of all, and I'll make this quick, I don't say attack a technique. And I was actually on um, Chronic Combat Conversations last week, and I told them, when I talk to a fighter, don't attack the technique. The technique is the technique. The technique is easy to attack. Everybody, technique, technique. This, this, this. The reason people talk about volume or biting down or having to walk through fire is because it's a test of character. And lots of guys will pass the technique test early, but you put some pressure on them, and they will not pass the technique test later because their character will force them to quit. Um, that's where you get fighters who they get takedowns, and they, but the guy gets back up. Mentally, they're breaking because they weren't expecting that guy to get back up. So now they don't want to wrestle and they'll start striking or they just start half-hearting wrestling because they're they're thinking about their energy or they just mentally break and get reversed and get beat up like a Sarah McMahon. She she leans on her wrestling and every time a fighter can fight her or challenge her in multiple positions, it's like she can't handle it. Like if she wrestles you and she can control you, confidence builds, confidence builds. You get up, it's like, oh shit. She can't, con- she can't, can't establish dominant position. Oh shit. Like what the fuck's going on? I, I'm I'm a silver medalist. How are you not just conceding to me? You know. And so mentally, she'll break. And the, the last example I use is a fight years ago. Frank Mir was fighting Brandon Vera. First couple first exchanges, he's blocking, he's slipping, he's checking. Everybody's like, "Ooh, Frank's gotten better. Look at that. Look at that striking." But as Brandon Vera kept chipping away, Frank Mir's not that disciplined on the feet. He gets a little gun shy. He gets a little antsy. He gets a little overwhelmed by if you throw a lot at him. So for the first two exchanges, fine. Exchange after exchange after exchange, he started breaking down because that's who he is as a person. That doesn't mean he's a bad fighter, but you've seen fights. As long as his plan A is fine, he can control it, he can move. He's a competent striker, but when guys start mixing it up, attacking multiple levels, their own lots of volume, his defense tends to fade. Now, if Brandon Vera got scared off like, oh, the first two exchanges didn't work, let me change my game plan, he would have been toast. He would have been fine. But Brandon Vera was like, okay, he's good the first two. Let's see if he goes to third. Let's see if he goes to fourth. And it started breaking down. So it's like you attack the character. Whatever they've shown historically, that's who you attack. They have to prove they're not that same fighter mentally. Until they prove it through three rounds or five rounds, and they have to do it more than once. It can't just be one fight. I'm, until you win three or four fights, when you get challenged in that area, I, I don't believe I don't believe you conquer that. So attack the character. Attack the character. See what happens. The technique. Technique is is real different. It's hard to attack, but the character is there mm-hmm. consistently. Most people don't change who they are as a fighter. They'll change techniques, but they don't change who they are as a fighter from here all the way to the end of their career. They're pretty much the same guy. Absolutely. Kind of like I said in the beginning of uh, far as analysts, I think that you have to have a certain type of personality to even be an analyst, right? And the same goes for being a fighter, kind of to your point as far as, um, you know, as far as those things go, because, you know, like, in Chinese Kung Fu, there was the five animals, the dragon, snake, pan. And, and it's woo-woo, yes, but to me, how I broke it down is there are five personalities, you know, and, and tigers and cranes are a little more easier to break down. Tigers are aggressive. When two tigers meet, one's maimed, one's killed, right? Crane, I was much more of a crane, man. I, of course, we all want to be the dragon, but I was probably more of the crane, man. I'm a, a counterfighter, defensive, balanced, smooth, you know, maybe more of a snake in there, a little bit of a panther, you know, whatever, but it's, it's just a personality trait. That's all it is. You could talk about the woo-woo and the technique part of it. Uh, there is a, a, bind, a bonding thing, which is, which is the personality. So I think that tying our number fives tied it well together in that sense. Knowing your fighter, for Schwan, and kind of their psyche. And a side note, just before we push on to your number four, Sean, I wrote here, I put positive vibes in the psyche. Uh, obviously, the establishing of knowing your fighter from broad levels on their weak, you know, weaknesses and whatnot and to their psyche is important like we just laid out. But once all that stuff's done, uh, I wrote psyche slash positive vibes because from my personal experience, Sean, and I can't imagine in this like COVID area era where you're really quarantining, uh, you know, there's, there's much more condensed time with your coaches and your bubble. 
uh, in prep for the camp, and there's much more mental stresses for everybody involved outside of the fight itself, right? That having a positive mindset is so damn important. And I don't think people realize that. I think a lot of coaches realize that. I'm sure I'm preaching the choir to that. But I think this is important to note for the outsiders maybe watching, Schwan, that like, you know, again, you don't want to baby your fighter. I'm not talking about that. But when you're like on, on a fight day or when you're cornering a fighter, like something's bothering you or you see some shit going down because you're scouting who we're getting, you know, which, which cut man's getting assigned to which room. We're trying to figure out which ref. I see Mazzagatti. I'm like, I'm praying, right? Like, okay, I'm ho hopefully my guy doesn't get Mazzagatti here. I'm um, here in Vegas, right? I mean, where you still doing shows, unfortunately. So, like, you're, you're worrying about these things, but you don't want to give that off to your fighter, man, because if you've been in that position, especially, you know that, like, you're so sensitive, your receptors, you know? And I think that's something that I really take my hat off to, especially these coaches that do it right, is, like, how selfless you really need to be, I think, is more than the positive yeah. vibes message. It's just how selfless you need to be from every aspect, even after monitoring your internal thoughts, because... Not to sound woo-woo, but yeah, you give off vibes and that energy can, can manifest itself into negative things. And that is just a really unspoken and underrated part um, that I just wanted to mention. It's, it's like almost like being a parent. Sometimes you just like, if you have good parents, there's so much stuff they had to eat or not say or just smooth over so that you could take your test. Whatever sport you went through or whatever dream you're following, they could support it. They lent you the money. You didn't know that's the last $3,000 they have, but they gave it to you and they didn't want you to know. So they wanted you to key in 100%. You have to eat a bunch of stuff. You can't let anything disrupt it. It means you got to take the shitty room, take the shitty room. You don't get a room, you don't get a room. It don't matter. As long as that everybody else is happy and we can get this job done, we can we can figure it out later. I'll call you out later. We'll have this discussion later. But right now, we need him to be, him or her, to be 100% positive, focused, and locked in. They can't have any sense, tension in the room. That's, that's no good. Absolutely. Perfectly put with that analogy, parenting analogy. My man. Perfectly put. All right. I think we covered number five and we're both on you know, similar you have a stance. Voice. You should be doing R&B &B smooth radio. You have that kind of voice. It's funny, man. You know, I used to, you know, like, especially when I was like, you know, jocking a register and stuff for my corporate, uh, for my corporate gig back in the day, like old women mainly would come through and like, you have a voice for a radio, son. And it was just kind of funny that although I'm technically not on radio anymore, but you know, Kind of yeah, doing that, yeah. doing that, do, doing that broadcasting thing. So thank you, I appreciate that, my man. All right, uh, number four. Let's keep it in the similar, uh, similar tone. You lead us off. What what made your number four? Um, number four for me is down. What you do in downtime. The biggest, and what I mean is the biggest mistake fighters make. This is everybody. I hear this all the time. Like I'm gonna fight a wrestler, right? So in that six to eight week camp, I'm going to overdo my wrestling i've been wrestling with the olympic team i've read yeah that's great and fabulous you're not going to pick that up in six to eight months what happened what you're supposed to do is between fights is which is why i'm not a fan of fighters fighting all the time past a certain point especially mm -hmm. lower levels you can fight it's like boxing you can fight five six seven eight nine times lower level because it's the, the quality of opponent when you start raising higher you need time in between so you can work on different skills without the pressure of knowing a fight's going to happen because you can develop your grappling in the three months where you have no fights with no pressure. It's flowing. It's easy. We can talk. We can, you know, have fun with it. But when there's a fight coming up, the coach has got to lean on you because, look, we have this fight coming up. You can't be getting swept like this. You can't be getting taken down like this. You can't be getting held up against a cage like this. There's pressure, and pressure affects everybody. That's why when somebody is shooting on a court by themselves, they hit a thousand jumpers in a row, and as soon as somebody's in front of them, now we went from a thousand to five hundred. How the hell did that happen? It's the same motion, it's pressure. So during the downtime, people are just they're doing more of what they want to do. They like striking, they do a bunch of striking. They like sparring, they do a bunch of sparring. They like grappling, they do a bunch of grappling. Wrestling, they do whatever they like to do, or they just check out completely. But your camp is to streamline all the skills you develop and point them in a direction. But you have to have the skills to streamline, and guys don't expand their skill set. I know for a fact. I talked to fighters. They're like, yeah, remember that camp where he said he was in the gym all day? Yeah, he was in the gym all day, but he's only working an hour and a half, and it was only on the stuff he wanted to. Oh, mm -hmm. I didn't know that. That's why I told you not to bet on him. Oh, sh sh now, now I question everything. In between camps, you're supposed to be expanding your skill set. In between those fights, you're supposed to be develop finding out your weaknesses, and if you can't technically address them, find out – alternatives that can help expose it less like little things that kind of mask it in the meantime until you can address it you're not good at takedowns well then your jab multiple level jab that'll dissuade takedowns 
if you sit down on your shots with your hips, that'll dissuade them. If your foot works a little bit better defensively and offensively, that'll dissuade takedowns. Now, that's not a fix, but you you can't, you can't fix everything overnight. But you should be developing alternatives. You should be developing solutions. Most of the time, people just keep doing the same thing they want to do, and that's why you see fighters who might go on a five-fight win streak, and then they get beat with something as simple as a jab. Like, wait a minute, wait yep. a minute. You want a five-fight win streak in the UFC, and you don't know how to slip a jab yet? And not, well, not to, we're not, and, we're and, not and, a boxing camp. And, and, You've been with them for seven years. How have you not figured this out? Sean, and not to interrupt, but this, it, and not to timestamp the episode, but I think the last two main events at the time of this recording are perfect examples of, of this. You had Nganu Miocic, and then before that, you had Holland and Brunson. You have Holland, who taken a bunch of fights and, and normal, and that's been his normal state of play. But as you get to the higher levels, you make these jumps. You know, you get perhaps you get rewarded for, you know, like we talk about, some of the worst things you can happen when you're rewarded for, you know, kind of bad behavior, so to speak. Gets past Souza. Now he's in this main event with a guy who, say what you will, is more tried and true and tested. And it took the more traditional methods to get there, which was Derek Brunson. You know, and we see what happened. To your point, like very simple things were were were, were solving it, right? Not to not to, to to dive back into that too deeply. Where you have Nganu, whereas the most thing is like, oh, well, the one sample size we have with him in the last year is him sw swinging stupid hooks. You know, maybe he degressed, and you, you start speculating, and that can get dangerous. It can lead you the wrong way, and perhaps you know, it, Nganu could have been led the wrong way if he would. You know, was with coaches or whatever that would just let him just only only strike. You know, and and if you looked at his Instagram, it did kind of look like he was only doing that. However, if you knew behind the scenes, and I think what was proven, um, is that yeah, you know, that could be a bad thing to let the time off. Or if you have a really raw guy who got into the game a bit late, like Ninganu, and he's around people who are smartly trying to prepare him, you can make a lot of gains in that time. To your point. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's. It's very, like, I always use Donald, heavy hands used to say this all the time about Donald Cerrone. Mm -hmm. He would go on these fight win streaks, but it'd be against third and fourth tier fighters. And then he'd fight an elite guy, and he'd lose the same way he lost the last time he fought an elite guy. You don't have any time to improve when you're constantly, it's like, I'll compare it to this. In basketball, it's pay, playing pickup a lot, playing a lot of games. That gets you comfort, that gets you a skill set, but it only refines what you already know. In martial arts, that's what I've done. I didn't learn the traditional way, so I just sparred a lot. So there's certain things I know no matter what. If I could be out of the, I could be out of the gym for months. I know exactly how I'm going to defend a jab. I know how I'm going to land my jab. I know what's going to happen when I get taken down. There's certain things that are automatic, but I haven't diversified. And it's the same thing that happen to these fighters. They keep winning, but they don't have answers. They don't they don't expand their skill set. So they didn't know how to jab before. They know how to jab now. They didn't know how to defend a leg kick before. They didn't know how to defend a leg kick now. Because there's no growth in between. You have to have that growth in between. And your camp is supposed to be on you about that. If you're a great striker, what are you doing? I mean, yeah, we don't abandon striking. But what the hell are you doing doing four hours of striking a day when you can't grapple? You yep. can't defend a takedown. What are, what are we doing here? We can spend 45 minutes on striking. We need to spend the rest of time on how to either use your striking to dissuade takedowns or learn how for you to get back up, secure position, hold position, not wait for the rest to rescue you. Like Cheyenne Bies did when she got headlocked for three rounds straight, we need to teach you how to get back in either counter or get back on your feet. You already can strike very well. If you're light years ahead of everybody striking, they're not going to catch up overnight, but they will catch up on the fact that you've had the same weakness for the entirety of your run in the UFC. That's why you see guys go all the way up to number three, and then somebody gets switched out and it's a wrestler, and they get taken out. You're like, how did you get to number three and you can't even – you can't defend a double leg. Yep. You can't even stay off the cage. You're pushing yourself to the cage. It's it's the downtime. That's the, that's the most important. Not the time in the camp. Not the time with your anything else. It's that downtime that really defines who you are as a fighter. If you don't see that growth between guys, you can just mark them for failure moving forward. You might as well just mark them for failure. Yeah, we all. This is only number four, but I could tell you this is you, your number four. Schwan is already one of my favorite ones and I'm under most understated ones I think a uh, really important one you could justify I don't even know the rest of your list but you could justify that higher if you wanted to that's a great point um and and by the way you know for MMA betters that do listen to the show this is one that actually translates to you guys too as far as that note for tracking these fighters that are taking these fights or you know leaving some room to be surprised when they haven't been taking fights for a while something to keep in mind uh, my number four is pretty basic Schwan. It's kind of more of a prerequisite kind of to have it on there. So uh, I'm not going to dive too deep on this, but you can launch off it if you want, if it sparks anything for you. But I pretty much just put specialized coaching because whether you're a super camp 
that, and I don't want to get too much into the argument, which it is a relevant one at this point, whether you're a super camp or you have the camp mentality uh, of belief that more well-rounded the better, or you're a smaller camp, you know, that specializes and, you know, also not just from a surface level or a, a overhead level, you're a smaller camp, but I'm talking about even within the meta of your approach, right? You know that your guy is a jiu-jitsu guy. How do we add on to that? Or you know that your guy is a striker. How do we fortify that? Um, obviously, there's two different approaches there, and, and, and that's kind of like a whole different conversation on on, on, on what is the right or, or how to attack each of those approaches individually. However, I do feel like putting at least somewhere as, as a general number, you know, for my number four, at least specialized coaches, it's a basic kind of no-duh, but it is something that, it needs to be on there because you do see, you know, um, some coaches, whether it's the small camp or the big camp, they both can be susceptible to overextending themselves, right? Especially the good coaches. Yeah. And, and not even because they're bad. It's usually because they're good. They're good people. They're good coaches. But because you're a good coach, you're usually a bad businessman and you're usually a bad planner. So a lot of these guys as well overextend themselves. So something that's important in all business, right, is to delegate. So you, I put specializing coaches, but really it's delegation could be the key word for why I put it in there because how important it is to delegate uh, things, uh, both for your benefit as the coach so you don't overload yourself and also for the benefit of the fighter. You know, Don't be doing this if there's somebody within reach that relevantly can be doing it a lot better for your fighter. You know, If it's an ego thing or a control thing or a cut of the pie, all the politics that go in with it, I, I know that kind of can be a separate story, but I still would argue, generally speaking, that delegation – is a good thing no matter the size of your camp or your approach any thoughts on that yeah this one will be a real short example ronda rousey edmund tarvidivian a lot of people say he's an incompetent coach i never thought he was incompetent he actually did things that helped her i actually wrote an article about the good the bad and ugly he did people were surprised when they read it because i had like a lot of good things he built her confidence and technically what he did was he taught her how to transition from that striking into that judo range the best example was when i think when she fought a was it jessica davis i think it was davis i can't remember the fight but yeah. basically she transitioned got a clinch needed the body flipped her it was like dynamic and if you watch fighters he's worked with certain aspects of their game mostly striking improve um he just didn't have enough support system he tried to cover everything and i don't know that he had the bandwidth or the experience to effectively cover now he could run the camp and like hire the people but it seemed like he wanted a little bit too much control to me and it kind of plateaued her, her her skill development in my opinion there were some areas that she was lacking in that she didn't have to given her fame and her money he could have gotten anybody in there and so i feel like that's a key example he was good in one area but there were so many other areas he was weak in that she didn't really develop in she just got by on her initial skill set what he taught her and her physical talent i mean she's an olympic level athlete fighting maybe very good high school athletes. So there's a once again a margin for error, but that's that's a very good point you make, and I think more people should address it. Specialize so that everybody can give you the best of what it is, and then somebody else can put it all together. Absolutely, yeah, definitely, it definitely doesn't hurt. Um, let, let's uh, let, let's push on from that one. And by the way, I, I, that also encompasses like you know uh, as far as like the growing aspects of the game you know uh, sports psychology nutritionist strength and conditioning obviously that's all encompassed that's important that is a part of the evolution of the game um, so that's another reason why i kind of had that that all encompassing number 4 um so we're we're clear on that one i think i think we're all clear on that one let's go to number 3 man what did you have for your number 3 Schwan? i think you should to have um, you shouldn't be in an echo chamber as a coaching staff whether it's hiring outside people or just getting people who have strong differing opinions the worst thing you can have in a coaching staff is where everybody sees it the exact same way because then that only prepares you for what one person sees, and then that's where the bias comes into it. If everybody thinks that the only way you can lose this fight is through striking, what if the guy's a better wrestler? Is nobody asking, but what if he gets in this position? What if you can't get that takedown? Somebody has to go against the grain to keep everybody on their toes. You can't just assume, every, no matter how good you are, everything you teach is not going to work because the other person is a fighter and has a camp and is preparing too. Somebody has to push back. That's where the evolution comes from. Failure, make an adjustment, go forward. But if everybody's just like, oh, no, I see it your way, or he's the main man, or you you made everybody so scared of pushing back against you, that there's going to be cracks that things slip through, and people are going to see them, and they're not going to say it because 
you made people scared to say it. Luckily, I'm not attached to these camps I work with, so I can say whatever the hell I want. I'm like, wrong, dude. That's not going to work. Oh, no, you'll be able to finish him. I don't know what he's telling you. That guy's a much better grappler than you. That's going to get you finished. Two weeks later, yeah, man, I got, yeah, I saw what happened. You got finished. I told you that was going to happen. I was the only person saying it. Well, yeah, but you're not in the camp. Hey, whatever, y'all. Y'all paid me for my opinion, and then, then you totally just ignored it, threw it in the trash. You have to have somebody who's going to push back against it. That doesn't mean you listen to them, but at least go through the thought process of what they're saying. Because you get somebody comfortable with a fight going one way, and the minute it goes a second, they fold. And it's your fault because you didn't prepare them because you had everybody patting each other on the back. Great idea, great idea. Great plan, great plan. No, it's not a great plan. And somebody needs to say it. I love this. This is this parlays perfectly to my number three. But also, I would argue, kind of attaches to what we just came off of, right? I mean, that could be an argument for a delegation as well. Uh, because, again, you're challenging the ego structure. You're not allowing some, you know, some really outdated dogma that could be more detrimental to the fighter. The person you're, obviously, you're trying to help in the first place, right? Um, but it actually, I, I, not taken away, because I'm just going to add to your number three, because mine is... Um, scouting outside of fights and i put in parentheses critical thinking uh or scouting outside of fighters uh critical thinking so that could be hiring a scout like schwan right or which is important for the reasons why because you, you need discourse inside or um which we'll talk about some coaches have which is good they have they have a similar uh theory philosophy as you schwan um so they always uh you know look at themselves as the enemy, so to speak, and how they would be and what's going wrong rather than fueling the ego. That The ego is going to get fueled fine, especially if you've got you know world champions or big pro athletes under your belts. There's going to be no shortage of that. You need to keep you know your head on a swivel and be real with what's kind of in front of you. Um, and I would argue that that no echo chamber, which is what I wrote for year number three, really ties into the scouting outside of a fighter. Because again, fighters are going to be energizer buddies. They're going to have their certain opinions. And you can extend those to a different set of biases for the coaches. So whether it's extending the coaching staff or extending outside of the coaching staff to analysts, outside eyes, scouts, right, uh, for opinions and strategies, I think it's super important because, again, something I stress, whether you're trying to break down fights as an analyst or a lot of MMA gamblers follow my content, and the same rule applies there, Schwan, which is... The, the key word bias your bias is really gonna, gonna 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 fuck you up before the opponent can even touch you or your guy your bias will fuck you up long before then pardon my french yeah just what real quick story there's a fighter who i i had been talking to and he was close to being the ufc like they were couldn't recall he'd been like on a big win streak his camp was old school they're like Jabbing isn't that jab and stuff that's not going to get their attention. It got, it got got you some attention, but you need to close the show. You need to be dynamic. This fool lost three fights in a row that he probably wouldn't have lost if he just would have stuck his jab and used his footwork, set everything off the jab. So basically, I I know what he can do. I didn't do anything. I just said, get back on your jab, everything off the jab, kicks, combinations, footwork, defense, everything off the jab, jab and jab feints, everything off of it. Wins four fights in a row. Once again, starting to get some attention. His camp tells him, yeah, enough of that boring stuff. Let's get back to getting in people's faces. Loses two in a row. One by submission, one by knockout. And it's like everybody in his camp is signing on for this to get rid of a jab. How do you get rid of a jab when a guy who's on a 7-5 win streak then decide to go the opposite direction? What are you doing? Then he goes on a 4-5 win streak and we go the opposite direction again because everybody's here. Yeah, yeah, press him. Get, get him up against the cage. Well, a jab will help you do that too. Force the scrambles. Get take. It's like everybody's supporting a clearly, clearly erroneous idea after you've seen him multiple times have success at good levels of competition use, using this approach because you want to put your stamp on it, we're going to go the opposite direction and then ruin this kid's career. He has like four knockouts on his career he shouldn't have. Even if he would have lost the fights, he wouldn't have those knockouts had he just did what he normally does. But his camp all agree that he should be more exciting and I don't know what he's doing right now. Struggling last time I heard I don't think he fights anymore, but yet a, a proven example of what's happening. Yep, uh, ego and bias. I mean, that that could really be an underlining theme for this whole list. All right, on that little quick edited break there, we're going to do a Chinese fire drill as we'll switch it around for my number two. Of course, our number three is just tied together. Uh, Schwan had no echo chamber. We're me scouting outside of the fighter, so getting that outside perspective. And 
I'll use the word scouting to kind of segue from my three to two. And the reason why I use the word scouting, because it, it parlays into number two, which is strategic objectives is for me. And again, having that healthy discourse and avoiding the echo chamber can get you a more sound, uh, whether or not it'll work, that, that, that's to be determined, right? But a more sound approach to your strategy, I would argue, when you take the egos and biases out of the equation, you'll at least have a little more clear vision to work with. What you choose and what the fighter chooses to do, that's a whole nother conversation and story. But I would argue clearing those things uh, can help for what I believe, obviously, it's my number two, is an important step, which is strategic objective. No matter the big camp, the small camp, whatever the specialized coaches you have, um, going on the uh, you've you, you've known your fighter hopefully by this point both their psyche to their their physicality right and those kind of limits and ranges um, but really what's what's the point of the camp if you don't have something you're working toward right a strategic objective and even if a lot of these fighters don't like even watching tape much less having game plans even those most ardent fighters their coaches aren't the same way thankfully um, to different varying degrees of effectiveness but thankfully the coaches do to their credit as they should uh, put the thought into it to, to, to take that off the fighter's plate if that is, in fact, how the fighter wants to approach it. You know, don't tell me anything. Just point, and I'll shoot. Um, but even in those situations, you need strategic objectives, at least, I believe. Sounds super obvious, but, Shawan, what do you think about my number two? Uh, I think it's a good one. I, I think too many times it's the whole thing of you see guys out there, and they have this general, oh, I'll just go get them, or whatever the hell it is. Take the center of the cage without any context to it, you have to have a goal you're going to. You have to have a, a firmly established plan A. Because even if plan A doesn't work, at least something in plan A works. It just doesn't work as a whole. You can take something from that. And between rounds, you can make an adjustment. You can tweak. But if you don't have any sort of plan or strategic objective, then you're basically just – it's like rolling. It's like going to a basketball game. You got five kids. Just go and play. What? That works against a certain level of talent. It does not work against superior talent. So you have to have a you have to have an objective. Otherwise, your your time in camp pretty. If otherwise you, you don't need to pay a camp. If y'all don't have a strategic objective, you're just paying them to spar you and to condition you, and you can just do that yourself. You can just get get a trainer at Gold Gym and, and show up on sparring night and get the same effect. Basically, if they're doing that, they don't have an objective or at least a starting point. You you don't need a camp. Just save all the money and train yourself. I mean. You're, you're going to get the same results, to be, yeah. to be quite honest. That's what that's I would a, think. That's a great way to put it. And and also, one feeds the other, whereas, yeah, you could probably have a better strategic approach if you're good about parsing through egos and biases that we all naturally have. Also, I would argue that if you are taking a strategic approach, chances are um, you are a coach uh, or a staff uh, member, uh, however you want to put it or formalize it, that um, – does in fact probably look at your own weaknesses and stuff and it probably you probably have a much more healthier psyche if in fact you were if you're going about it in that approach not say one is better than the other but i mean you know that it's some kind of a semi-empirical stuff we're talking about you know uh, it, it, like you said if, if you're not paying for the strategy if you're not thinking about that well what the heck are we all standing around and grouping and gathering together for yeah pretty much and as a coach just to kick off that when i'm scouting for people or just in general whether it's basketball, or MMA, I spend a lot of time watching film, breaking down fights, going back and forth, or talking to people. I talk to coaches all the time. Arlene Sanchez from uh, Fit NHB. We used to talk to Marcus Dave a lot, Stephen Wright, just anybody, even guys at lower levels who coach or fight. I like to talk business with them because it's like it keeps your mind sharp. And as a coach, part of your job is to work as hard as the fighters work, and not just for a specific opponent, but overall. So when something crazy happens, you have you have something to refer to. But if you've only been hung up on because a strategic approach can be shaped, can be streamlined, can be redirected, repointed, whatever you want to call it. But if you've only been focusing on one sort of thing or one type of fighter, then that's more of a technical, direct, to the point thing. You can't really change that. St strategy, you can adjust. Techniques, you add on to or you, take, you drop off, you add on, you refine. But strategy is more conceptual. If you don't understand the concepts of fighting, you can't really help anybody in a corner or past a certain point. So it's up to the, the coach to do as much as they can to expand their ability to process concepts and to come up with concepts to help you. Like if they don't understand it conceptually, it doesn't matter how good technically you are, the right idea ultimately will be good technique because good technique is only good because you use it in the right spots. You know, if the question is defending a takedown and you have a good jab, 
your jab means nothing because you're not doing the right thing. So that strategic aspect is a big plus. Coaches need to really be working on that on a consistent basis. Absolutely. Great. Perfectly. I couldn't have put it better myself. So I'll actually stop that there and pick up with your number two. Does your number two touch this? If not, no worries. What made your number two spot, Schwan? Uh, my number two, it kind of indirectly touches it. Um, it's getting the right sparring partners. When I worked with Claudia Cadelia's team at the time, they actually asked me for recommendations for sparring. And I've always had recommendations for sparring for people, but nobody's ever asked. And that's why a lot of guys like Floyd Mayweather boxers always do very well because they bring in specific sparring. In MMA, you spar, oh, I'm a Jackson. I get high-level sparring all the time. High-level sparring doesn't mean anything if it's not similar to the style you're going to be facing. It means something in a downtime between fights, it's great. But for a, sp a specific opponent, high-level sparring means nothing if the style and the mentality of the fighter is the total opposite of what you're facing. You face a volume guy who throws, 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 and then the guy you're going to fight is the guy who fights off the back foot. What the hell did that prepare you for? Absolutely nothing. You know, I, I've been in camps before. We had a guy years ago who was getting over for a shoot boxing fight. They kept having me spar with them. I'm like, don't you have someone better to spar with this guy than me? And they're like, there's guys better than you, but they're all front foot guys. The guy he's going to face, we have two potential guys. They all fight on the back foot. They all jab. They all pot shot. Getting him used to a thousand punches around is no good when he's only going to be taken. He only has to avoid really 15 to 20 really accurate shots. He needs to be prepared for what he's going to face, not – not high level, the opposite direction. That's where a lot of fighters mess up because they don't, they're they not getting prepared properly. Um, I'll use two examples. In Ganu, and I remember Brock Lesnar said this against Frank Mir. He took Frank Mir down, he beat him up. He said, the guys I spar with get out of those positions. I don't think a lot of guys get stuck because they face guys in sparring who they let put them in certain positions or let land shots on them. And you can say, yeah, I got works my defense, I work with my get ups, whatever. But the fact of the matter is, in the back of your mind, you still know he couldn't have taken you down. You still know he wouldn't hit you with 90% of those shots. That's going to make you lazy and sloppy. You need a guy who can force you into those spots and make you work to get out of them. Because if you've had to work through your downtime in the camp, then when you're in a fight and you have to work a little bit harder, it won't, fra it won't frazzle you because you've been used to having to work. If you face guys who, when you hit them with power, don't back off and they press you, then when a guy walks through your power to fight, you're prepared for this. You've already seen it. But most guys aren't prepared for that. They're used to, I just get back up. I just throw him off me. Okay, you tried to throw me off and I didn't go nowhere. Uh-oh. Oh, He took me down. He held me down like Angela Hill versus Michelle Watterson. Yeah. When Michelle Watterson took her down, that broke her. She held her for a whole round. And, and from that point on, Hill didn't want to commit to strikes. She didn't want their volume. And she's like, this little girl took me down and held me down for a whole round. Now i got to avoid it. Now Michelle Watterson comes out on the feet. Because now you're, you're definitely afraid of going on the ground because you're not – used to people holding you in position on the ground. If you did, you wouldn't have any fear of that. You'd go right back to what you did because you're thinking she can't do that two rounds in a row. But when you never had it happen, you start getting scared because you're like, she does this twice, it's done, I'm lost. So you need to bring the right people in who can make your person work and force them to develop. People do not push themselves hard. If they're not forced to develop, they won't. That's why basketball trainers have, people have trainers because they'll just get comfortable with what they always do. They, they have to have somebody kicking them in the ass saying like, dude, that ain't going to work. Oh, you think it's going to work? Here. Here. Here's my guy. Lock him up. Oh, yeah, that move doesn't work. Exactly like I told you. Francis got it. I just get right back up. He didn't have anybody big enough and strong enough to put him in those positions. Then when it happened, what did he have? No answers, no adjustment. I guarantee you his new guy put in fail states and put him against guys who could make him and force him to adjust. Your athleticism means nothing here. You have to have skills now. Yep. Yeah, no, absolutely. This is a great one. This is one that I missed, and I knew I missed it because when I, uh, uh, not sequestered, that's the wrong word, but when I when I got some opinions from some other coaches to send me their list, right? Um, Tyson Chartier, who we'll get to, uh, actually, this was this was high on his list as well. And I'm like, wow, I missed it. That's so, it's so damn important. Um, not just for the, the reason, obvious reasons and whatnot and the, uh, how, you, how well you put it, but like, here's another perspective when I go and do my – studies i always break down the cards from top to bottom you know i, I don't get to give all the the, the the especially in this era it's so hard to give every fight uh, its attention and most of these fights get canceled yada yada point is my process is a lot of the times um it's it's you know when i went on a, a podcast recently uh, asking how i break down fights and i explain i explain a lot of people um we all have our different styles and our biases and our experiences are going to shape different approaches no matter who you are but 
I think it's safe to preach, perhaps uh, as a starting point, a forensic uh, angle, as forensics are generally based upon facts and trying to find things out. Uh, you know, and we all have our own different forensic process. And part of mine's like, for example, we got an orthodox fighter facing a southpaw. Well, I'm going to go look at the orthodox fighter first, and specifically, I'm going to look at how he does against southpaws. Um, and see if there's a common theme. See what I can learn and then go from there. Will I watch fights from Orthodox fighters? Or sure. Yes, within context for different reasons, yeah. But mainly, I'm going to be looking at the objective of the styles, right? From the stance to the basic style. Is this guy a striker? Is this guy a grappler? And you gave a great example on like, we need a guy off a of back foot in comparison to a swarming volume guy. But the thing is, you don't even have to get that nuance into the stylistic matchup for most camps to automatically fail the sparring partner test. Because when I go to their Instagram or I'm somewhat familiar with their camp and then go to their Instagram to see who in that camp they're training with, maybe they brought some outside people in, then most of them fail that test, whether they're fighting, facing a wrestler. I'm like, but their camp is not known for wrestling and the guys he trains with aren't good at wrestlers. Or they're facing a southpaw and I'm like, I already know there's barely any southpaws in any of the weight divisions in that camp, much less the ones they're training with. Let me go to their Instagram. I don't see any new guys here, much less any southpaws. I mean, it sounds so basic, but so many people, I would say, I would argue it's a generous to say 70 percentile on a surface level fail this test to prepare their fighters with sparring partners. Yep. Which sounds yep, like a, which I, sounds like a huge, a huge accusation, but that, that I, I stand by it. You, you notice in fights, somebody will say, well, he's never faced a wrestler. Or he's never faced a striker at that level. You know what I always tell people? That's true. And I make that point too. But this is the biggest thing. It's like saying I hate to keep bringing basketball up, but it's something I do. I love basketball. In high level basketball, you practice more than you play. In MMA, you'll spar more <laughs> rounds than you will ever fight in your life. So if you're also not sparring southpaws, you're not sparring wrestlers, not just not fighting them, you're not sparring them. Even if you fight a bunch of them, you're not going to get better because you're not seeing it on a day-to-day -day basis. You can't prepare for something you only see every once in a while. And most guys won't. They don't want to be uncomfortable. So I know this guy can take me down and lay on me. So I'm going to avoid sparring with him. What the hell sense does that make, dude? What sense does that make? In, in camps, let them get away with it. They either have the guys who can push them and they don't they keep them away so they can build confidence, lie, or they don't have the guys and they won't, pe they won't shell out the money because it's too expensive. Well, okay, cool. Go on your three-fight losing streak and see what happens to you. Because the best guys bring in specific sparring. Conor McGregor was bringing in specific sparring. Certain camps have the people, and they just force them to work with them. You're going to have to learn how to get through this. If you're not going to get through it, then we can't help you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Great point. And I don't mean to sound rushed, uh, although I, I I do actually have a hard out for this show. Uh, not the time yeah. stamp, but I'm getting my first vaccine, folks. So I apologize if I sound that in, but we are tack. I, I would say we're crushing a lot of good content here. So yeah. without further ado... Um, Let's go to our number one. Number two was sparring partners for you, and, and mine was strategic objectives. Uh, number one spot, I guess I'm still going first, huh? So I guess I'll, I'll lead because mine's pretty generic. I don't think it's going to step on yours, or maybe you have the same one. This seems like a cop-out, uh, but it, it's important. And I believe all these things connect, you know, having that, that, that psyche, knowing your fighter, uh, having outside scouting, uh, objective scouting, specialized coaches, you know, to delegate your duties, strategic objectives, something to work for. But all those are for nothing if you don't have communication. So communication, I know it sounds like a cop-out. That is my number one, Schwam. And specifically, I want to point out to Las Vegas where I'm at because and the time we're at. Age of information is great. We know so much about weight cutting strategies. There's so many technical analysts out there that do videos and all these things. There's all these resources, the information within martial arts has made a huge jump in the last seven to eight years, for sure, outside of the fighting advancements. I'm talking about everything outside of the cage has made huge jumps as far as resources. However, you can have all those resources. You can be lucky enough to be in the UFC and move out here to the Las Vegas like a lot of people are doing, Schwan, right? Because the UFC PI offers you food and these, these strength and condition. They offer you the specialized coaches. Now your coaches don't have to worry about it. You've got all these super gyms or small gyms. Like You can choose all the things that we've been talking about this entire episode. That being said, one of the biggest problems out here, Schwan, when I talk to coaches is that they said when all that stuff opened up from the PI, all these opportunities, you get an influx of training partners and all these things, right? Training partners very important too. But what suffered the most was communication because now 
you had all the best people working together, but you had arguably even poor results because, you know, people were making their own makeshift camps at the PI and it's like fighters coaching each other over there because you only can bring in limited people. So you just have these group things of fighters and again, not shitting on fighters, but they're kind of energizer bunnies. They're not the people to be put in charge of critical thinking and strategizing. And they were like kind of running camps with each other, boyfriends, girlfriends, I'm friends, we're crossing this camp. Oh, it's okay because we're still going to this camp to do this and we're going to this camp for jujitsu. And you're getting all the best stuff and all that means crap without communication. So I just wanted to cite where I'm at and where the sport's at and how that's still relevant and can be a really detrimental despite having A pluses in every other category. Communication can unwind everything. Yeah, you're you're completely right. When I when I worked with King Mo, the thing I, I liked about King Mo the most was he'd be talking to multiple people and he'd have us all in a group chat. And I'd begin to talk to some coaches and they'd be like, I didn't think about that. Or I'd say something and they'd be like, that doesn't work for this reason. And at least I'd have an explanation. And they'd send me a video, whatever, it makes sense. Which you can't cover all the bases. If you're gonna work with certain people, there has to be, like you said, you can learn from a sparring partner, you can learn from a different coach, but you still have to either Take notes, which most guys aren't going to do, or better yet, have that guy contact your head coach so that you can not just learn that lesson right then, but you can take it moving forward un- under the guise of the person who knows you best. Because just because I call something out doesn't mean that it fits who you are as a fighter or not. It's just a, some another piece of information. You need the guy who's got your faith and got the biggest, best knowledge of you to process that and hopefully put it in correctly. But a lot of guys won't reach out. They won't speak out. I know all the time when I go on, I'll list people. I'll put a bunch of people. If got fighters need help, here's some guys who know a lot. And they'll work with your camp. You can come to me. First thing I'm going to do is talk to your coach because I want to get a better understanding of who you are and how you are and what we're trying to do. But, yeah, communication is something that would actually make the whole world better, not just MMA. The whole world can benefit from being better communicators. Absolutely, man. That's why it feels like such a cop-out. But it definitely ties in. That's my number one because it ties in everything. Without knowing your number one, I would argue communication probably fits with your number one. Um, What is your number one, sir? Yeah, well, my my number one, actually, when it comes down to it, my actual number one is is um, it is partly watching, knowing what you're seeing on film. A lot of coaches watch film; they have no idea what the hell they're watching. And I'll I'll use example. I won't use names in this, but I was at a camp finishing up camp where a girl was getting some sparring, and she fought Invicta. They were thinking about bringing her up to fight Cyborg, and she she had never fought anybody that big. But they were thinking because she had some good wins. She knew some people who were going to get a hookup. I was talking to her coach, and they were all sitting around the corner. She, We sparred. She beat the fuck out of me. So let's get that straight. But um, I punched. she told me to hit her, so I hit her, and she did not like that. So never listen to a fighter when they say hit me. Um, her, her coach was telling me they switched opponents. And he's like, it's basically the same opponent. And he told me the opponents, one opponent will let you fire off, and then she'll fire back immediately. The other opponent is a person who will strike with you, a same time counter. And he said, they're basically the same fighter. A same time counter person and an immediate counter person aren't the same kind of fighter at all. One person will let you get off and then fire right back and someone will be striking with you as you strike. Those aren't similar. And that girl got, she won the first round, was crushing and killing. Second round, boom. Fight with UFC, out. Central Cyborg matchup, out everything thrown in the dumpster fire and it's like i didn't understand how her coach watched film and he told me he watched a lot of film and he didn't pick up on this if your coaches are coming with strategic objectives and directions or techniques and they don't understand what's happening then everything they're teaching you is wrong and one other example there was a lower level fighter who i was working with and they were fighting this guy and they're like we don't know how to we don't know how to get him to shoot his submissions events is really bad he'll get submitted off of certain things but we don't know how to get him to shoot. He's a really good wrestler. He's he's pretty competent on the feet. And I watched three of his fights. And in 60 seconds, I figured out how to figure this out. They're like, we don't know how to get him to shoot, how to overextend. If you touch him to the body, he doesn't like getting hit to the body. You put two or three shots to the body, leg kicks, any sort of touch, he'll shoot off it because he doesn't like it. And they're like, how can we get him to extend himself to create scrambles, hunt for the sub- submission and transition? And I'm like, You've been preparing for this fight for three months and you haven't figured this out when it's in the first 60 seconds of his fight? Look at his fights. Front kick, front kick, shot. Other time, knee to the head, kick to the head, hooks, nothing. He won't shoot. He just bang it out with you. Touch him to the body, shoots. Touch him to the body, shoots. He did it four times in one round. And nobody in this camp noticed this, even though they've been watching film for three months. That's inexcusable. 
So if you can't process what you're seeing correctly, you can't possibly prepare them strategically, mentally, or even technically, because you're not seeing where the holes are. You're not seeing the trends. And a lot of fighters in their camps, they don't see trends. They don't see it at all. They have their bias, and this is how we're going to go, and this is going to break them. And you see them walking into stuff that you're like, like Conor McGregor, how did you not know about that calf kick? It's not the first time he's used it. How did you not know about that? Well, we didn't know. How did you not know? He's used it before. Yeah. He, you have to see what you're seeing. He's a guy himself who comes alive in southpaw versus southpaw matchups. Well, why do you come alive in that matchup, Connor? Why do you start throwing a bunch of stuff like uppercuts and stuff that you don't normally throw as heavily? Because the matchup stance opens up more weapons. So it's like, yeah, well, how did you not put that, that together? You you use the same theory for different reasons with different tools, but the same theory. And perhaps communication doesn't go with your number one. But I will say, uh, although you brought in bias, which I like, to show how that really... Because I, I was going to say, that coach, it was probably his striking bias that was allowing him to make associate two styles that were different together because his striking bias says it doesn't matter. He has the answers to those. Is that's, uh, that's how I kind of translate it, which could be dangerous, which is why you need the outside scouting, the communication, and that collaboration. And borrow again, referencing the uh, Fight Site's recent podcast about breaking stuff down and being analysts. And I think... It was a uh, shout out to Chungus Khan Tuman there saying that the, we, we could use more collaboration and communication within uh, the analyst space. If you're trying to be someone who's an analyst, whether you call yourself that or not, none of us should have or uh, for the most part, I don't think any of us has ego. We're like, we're the end all be all. We're the Bible. We're this. We're No, because you need different opinions. We all learn from each other. And I think that is I think that is that is very important. Um, in fact, uh, in and not to jump off your number one, we'll, we'll tie this up, but the two lists I'm going to reference, the two coaches, Eric Nixick and Tyson Chartier, they fought each other before on opposite corners, and one thing they do and try to do with other coaches who are open, which blew my mind and sounds crazy, but I think it's really smart if you if you have enough of an ego, uh, you're healthy enough of an ego to do this, but they actually will go through their strategic objectives and do all these a lot of the things we've covered, but at the end, like for example, the Calvin Cater-Dan Ige fight, they actually got together and exchanged notes on what they saw for each other's fighters' weaknesses to kind of compare with their own notes, you know? And these guys have a healthy enough ego where they, 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 they plan to plan against themselves, so to speak, in order to bring the strategy pre uh, in the first place. But I'm talking about post now taking those notes saying, how accurate, yep. how accurate was I on seeing my own weaknesses? What did you see? You know, you beat me. You guys beat, or even if they didn't, still, what did you see? I need to know because they want to they wanna better themselves. And I... I I think that's pretty rare for coaches to do, Schwan. You can weigh in, but I thought that was pretty cool. They're they're accountable. That's what you're that's what you're supposed to do. You keep telling your fighters you can learn from everybody, but then you won't take information from somebody else. Whether it's a fighter, every time you had a breakdown, I would pose an opposing point and then I'd ask you a question because I wanted to see what you see because maybe you're seeing something I'm missing completely. Yep. And so then I'd pose it, and your response would be like, "Okay, he's seeing the same way. Make up. Oh, I didn't think about this. Good catch. Kids, I train. What does your coach say?" What do your parents say? What do other players say? What's stopping you? I'll ask questions. Hey, you played this kid. What, what, what's, what's good about him? Oh, shit. Okay. I don't mind. I don't know it all. The only way I, my goal is to make a kid better, make a fighter better. I don't care who gets the credit. I'm just here to help do my part. And if more people would share that information, you wouldn't have these gaps. When people will have to, I'm the MMA guru. I don't want to lose this fighter. Well, if you're worried about losing the fighter, then, you're, then your main concern isn't the fighter's well-being. It's you keeping your source of income. And I get that. But that's not – you're, you're not care, you're not concerned about the fighter. You're going to let that fighter get knocked out because you have to have the answer. If I don't have it, I, I tell everybody, I will go get it from someone else. Or I'll send you to someone else. I don't – it's not that serious. Yep, absolutely, absolutely. And know what you're watching, but also the point that we've added on to of that is – Know when you don't know what you're watching, too. I think that's just as important. Know what you're watching, but also know when you don't know what you're watching. Because there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with asking somebody a different opinion. Like, we all have... I'm, I'm sure you, you're aware of your own biases at this point, Shawan. I'm sure there's things you can point to where you're like, I, I, I tend to get burned on this. This is something that I don't have the best track record on, but I'm very strong here. And it's good to kind of get a feel for those things, whether you're a coach, a fighter, um, or an analyst. So, I, I man, that was... That ties it up. That, that ties it up nicely. I, I love that number one of yours. Yeah, thank you, sir. All right. So just to recap, uh, five to one, really quick. Uh, for Schwan, it was knowing your fighter. Uh, five. Number four, um, make use of the downtime, which is still uh, my favorite, by the way, of all of everything listed. Number three, no echo chamber, uh, which is great. Schwan, uh, sparring partners. Number two, 
making sure you have the appropriate sparring partners. And uh, number one, know what you're watching from what we just kind of explained as well as know what you're not, know if you don't know what you're watching as well. Um, my quickly five to one was uh, uh, was uh, Psyche, kind of know, knowing your fighter's psyche in that sense. Um, number four was uh, specialized coaching, which is a very general. Number three was scouting outside of fighter. So critical scouting, critical thinking. Uh, parlaying that to number two, strategic objectives. And number one, tying them together, uh, communication. For those curious to recap what we just discussed here. Yeah. All right. Sounds about right. And oh, before, can I just add one second? To, please, yeah, go, to, go, please, please, yeah. Um, I also do two podcasts. One is the big topic on w, Women's Mixed Martial Arts with Frank Posen. Yes, yes. Women, yeah. Frank's great. Frank's Frank's the man. He sounds like Better Call. He sounds like Saul from Better Call Saul, doesn't he? He does. Saul Goodman. Every time I, I listen, great guy. It's uh, good. good guy. I have uh, the MMA ratings podcast I do with Rafael Garcia, and just three articles I recently released. Um, I did a breakdown of um, the DC Trinity, Wonder Woman, Batman, and Superman, their fighting styles and strategies. I did one connected to the Winter Soldier and the Falcon, mostly the GSP versus Captain America fight. I broke that down, and then I also on MMA ratings I have an article. It's kind of a, you can use it. It's about this. It's about the camps. You can use it as a reference point anytime they have a fight. You can use this podcast or you can use the article. And you see the fight, you can be like, they didn't do this one. They didn't do this one. They didn't do this one. It's clear they didn't do that. It's just kind of fun because it allows you to track fighters' progress and track what the problem is in their development. But those are the three articles I had. And I just wanted to make sure I gave the other podcast some on some love because they let me be on there and talk crazy. So. I wanted to give those ones, especially, you know, big Frank Pose in there as well. Uh, so I'm glad you got those in. Uh, I still got roughly about 10 more minutes to kill. So I just want to um, read off the coaches lists, uh, Tyson yeah. Shardy's and Eric Nixick's, and then you can weigh in on those if you if you want before we get out of here. And that'll be that'll yeah. be the last of it. That'll be the shouts, obviously, shouting out the coaches out there doing the damn thing um, that aren't afraid to communicate with, with uh, people like myself or us and, and, and kind of put themselves out there, which is probably why they get the success they get because they – they're willing to learn, you know, from uh, from from theirs or others' mistakes, and that was a common thing that we I think we wrapped up with, which is really important because we all make mistakes. We're all human. Um, we all have limits, right? So uh, Tyson Shardy just says uh, he said this is just uh, this kind of a, a, a more generic fundamental list, but it's still a good one. Um, he goes one: set up a weekly schedule for the camp. Two. Define which training partners and sparring partners will be involved. Again, super important one. Uh, three, break down video and establish a game plan. Four, film sessions as use, uh, uh, sparring sessions, I'm, I'm guessing. Film sessions as and use them for tools to educate fighters on how to pr improve, etc. I don't think we touched on that specifically, but I like that one. Um, I'll let you touch on that here in a second as I finish off his list quickly. Four, um, oh, yeah, that was four. Uh, five, last one, constantly be evaluating the fighter to be sure they are not overtraining. I thought that was a really solid list. Yeah. His, his list is only the, – the reason – my list is partly influenced by the fact the roles I've had. So I've never been, like, the guy. So for his list, that's perfect because he's he's um, right in there. My list is for – I mean, you could, you could apply to coaches, but it's also somebody who maybe not is the head coach and is an assistant – or maybe you're a fighter who's helping. There's many ways to help. Like you know, you can work a corner. And if you've paid attention to the stuff I list, maybe you're not directly in the camp, but you're working the corner and you've watched the same film. You have something else. You're like, oh, dude, he's doing this. He's doing this. And that might be the difference between a win and a, lo a loss. But is the big gun over it? That's flawless. Absolutely. And Eric's is kind of a little more generic one. Uh, not generic, but a little more uh, off off beat because we had a phone conversation. He but, did an amazing job this Saturday. He did an amazing job. He did, yeah. Yeah, very, very good stuff. I mean, I know I have my biases, and I always state my bias whenever I even talk about a fight, much less I'm actually picking with this fighter, which I don't do every time, by the way. I try to separate my bias and stay healthy, and he doesn't get offended when I don't pick him. Um, however, man, did, uh, when I do say stuff, though, even though I state my bias, I'm not going to sit there and lie, though, at the same time. Like, when I say good stuff about the guy, it's factual, so for him to go out and prove it, so it's not just talk. Um, it, it's fantastic. Eric said, uh, I, I respect him for that. I've had coaches write articles, complain, complain to people at combat press. I had a coach complain cause I was being too negative about a fighter when I'm just actually stating the facts about their holes in their game. And they told him to pull the article. They're like, well, we can't do that. 
He's like, well, I don't like that. Well, Eric, replace basketball with football, but uh, as far as film and tape and, and processes and having that to draw from, which is great analogies. That's what I love about listening to your perspectives. Eric's really similar in that sense, and as well as the more important point of the humility and picking off other people. He, he He's totally cool with the fact that he, he didn't professionally fight or didn't come from like a lineage like team. It, the information's out there. It's how you process it. You know, and that's kind yep. of what we're talking about. So he says strengths versus weaknesses and in parentheses, plan against yourself. Um, that's something that he always does, which we spoke about, right? This kind of goes under strategic objectives or this goes more under, I should say, scouting outside of the fighter, right? Planning against yourself as well as building toward, using that to build toward your strategic objective for the fight. Eric's a big, big, big proponent of that. Um, yes. Then he, he writes meat and potatoes and he says... Two or three things that he wants to focus on for the camp because, not to oversimplify, but people don't simplify enough and can overload. Again, the age of information, it's so easy uh, out here in Vegas especially. You have all this information out here. You can overload so easily. Forget the communication, right? Even if you have good communication, you can still overload the fighter. So he likes to say meat and potatoes, objectives, two to three things. Obviously, that's going to be based off the strength versus weaknesses assessment, right? It's going to fall after the strategy and, and that footwork's been done. Um, but, you know, uh, he says, uh, e.g., uh, octagon, uh, for uh, for Francis's, he told me, for Francis's, uh, in this recent fight, um, he said it was octagon control, uh, center mass targets, which detects level change. So, uh, which is why he came out attacking the body and center things. Uh, just really, you know, it's stuff we've heard before, but, like, it's not done enough. And it was a very... I'm glad, I'm glad he said that. I always feel body punching, and people were like, yeah, that's so predictable. I'm like it helps you detect level changes and stop takedowns. Like, do you not know that? And they're like, no, it doesn't. And I'm like, you need to get a new coach. If your coach yep. doesn't know that and I do, fire him. Absolutely. And and that's what Francis came out and did from the get-go, which even had me people, people like me that were like, whoa, I was a supporter. And I was like, wow, hey, hey. Doing the leading out, doing, doing the, uh, leading out of DiCaprio uh, once upon a in time in Hollywood meme, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Pointing at the screen like, ah, that's what we're <laughs> talking about. That's what you got to do. Um, and then he goes, um, I like this one. He goes, lastly, well, not least, he goes, um, he has a Thanksgiving analogy. And I think this ties into the communication and tying everything together for the camp and what we're talking about. And he pretty much was saying that, like, every Thanksgiving, I'm not a big Thanksgiving guy, but this this, this makes perfect sense. So if I can get it, you can. The, everyone knows what the main course is going to be. It's going to be, you know, turkey. You know, maybe you're going to have a ham or something like that for your meats. There's going to be some version of potatoes. But generally, sorry as my dog barks here, but generally um, the intangibles are the sides. You don't know who's bringing what over sides. you got relatives that come over and they start introducing some random sides. And one year it's really good and another year it's not so good. And if you're a control freak, especially in a game like MMA that's so volatile, you're never going to control what's on the table. But if you can focus back to his two to three objectives on the main course and what that needs to be, and if you can understand that there are, for better and worse, there are going to be intangibles from both sides brought in those side portions in the equation, the less shocked your fighter will be, like to your previous point, Sean, or the less shocked you will be as a coach, as a staff preparing your fighter, um, if you if you keep that kind of simplification in mind, your, your main course, where you're headed, and you don't st stress, also you don't let those sides and intangibles interfere with that main course because you're making sure that the shit that's holding down the dinner is good. Yeah. No, that's, that's a really great list. I, I'm a, I'm going to have to try and contact this guy. Cause he seems like a lot of fun to talk to. I, he is. I, if, I, if you I need like to contact, talking, let me know. I like talking to coaches. Shout out to Marcus Davis. who came on my show. Marcus Davis, Arlene Sanchez, Stephen Wright and Trevor Whitman. I love talking to coaches because they're just, they just have a different perspective on it. And it's like, it's ultimately, I know people say it's a, individual sport but it's still a team sport if yep. you don't have a coach directing you and team building you you can't you can't execute we've already seen we see what mike perry, perry looks like without a team it's not pretty so um exactly I, I, that's, that's those are good those are good coaches i like the fact that he talked about being simple because you're talking about the communication you get all this information you still got to get it back to the guy so he can parse it and get back to what who you are and what you can do so we can build around it because the biggest mistake i see people make is they'll get a piece of information and then try to switch everything and they go go against their character and against their skill set. It's like you can't do that. You need to just apply it to what you do or where you're weak at so you can strategize for it. You can't 
make that adjustment in three weeks. That doesn't happen. Exactly. So, yeah, that's a great list. That is a great list. Uh, yeah, and uh, if you ever want to talk to Eric, he's a really open guy. And I may, you know, try to do the same favor for you because, man, a guy I always looked up to and I love here. I can't hear enough of him is Stephen the War Master, right? Always been a big fan of that guy. Um, obviously, Trevor Whitman, uh, Arlene from Finn and HB. She never gets enough credit. Um, you know, obviously, yeah, all great names, great. but 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 Stephen the War Master, right? There's something about. I feel like I, 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 you know, did we just become best friends? Like he seems like one of those dudes I, I would get along with for sure. Great guy. Great guy. Fantastic. Sean, I got to get going to get this first Vax appointment, man. But this was uh, this was awesome. This was long overdue. I almost feel like I should be apologizing for not doing this sooner because this was such an awesome convo, man. I I'm definitely, you know, if you have time uh, sometime in the future, well, I'll, you know, I'll probably have you back on this show. I know you do. You do plenty, so I won't I won't push my luck. I just I appreciate your time, man. I really appreciate what you do, and. You killed it, man. You you killed it. You you, you really did. I I, I, uh, I thank appreciate you. you, dude. Like I I've never fought professionally or amateurly. I've just sparred, and that's not easy. But it's not fighting. So props to you. Cause I, props to you for doing something I've never done before. I admire you. I, I admire your passion for sport, your attention to detail. Like I said, you see it better than a lot of coaches. A lot of people should be hiring you instead of another coach because you would help them a lot more. And I'm saying this person who works with high level coaches. The ones I mentioned, fine. Some of these other guys. They're getting people killed, and you can help them out a lot. So thank you. It's been an honor. Anytime you want me on, you let me know. I'll find some time to make for you, man. My man, thank you very much. And again, um, catch the plugs uh, from a couple of minutes ago. I'll timestamp them. And of course, we got uh, Sean at Black Jordan Bean, B L A K, by the way, Jordan Breen on Twitter to find him and uh, all, all, all his connections and stuff there. Give him a follow. And again, like this video if you haven't. Subscribe to the channel, Daniel Tom MMA. Follow the podcast, the Protect Your Neck podcast, on all social platforms at the PYM Podcast. Don't pollute your feeds. It really helps. I'm going to save the Amazon reads and shouts like to special listeners like Robert G out there uh, for the next episode as I got to get out of here. Thanks again, Sean. And until next time, Two folks. Two-time shirt, call of the year. What's up? Two-time shirt, I'll call of the year. And That's right. King Mo said this, not me. He said that we won the Risen title, so I'm also the Risen Grand Prix champion. I didn't say it. He said it. Hey, so that's those call, those caller of the year things. Uh, shout out to my MMA junkie crew. That that stuff that stuff that stuff ranks high, man. Uh, and of course, we got love for the the sure Dog Radio OGs like yeah. yourself, man. So, all right, keep it real, like Schwan, and always protect your neck.